<laughs> hey, um, so we're doing something a little bit different here. Uh, uh, my name is Matthew Fogel. We've got uh, Jeffrey Rosetto, um, recorder, producer, Space Waver. Uh, and uh, we're both part of uh, the, the old St. Catharines home rock scene. Uh, I wanted to start actually uh, by taking a moment. Uh, we lost a friend, Jim Waring. And uh, just before we hit record here, uh, Jeffrey was telling me about the work that he's been doing to transfer the Schizotech tapes um, into the digital realm. Uh, Jeffrey, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, uh, so where, so where, do, where would you like to begin? Like, you know. Well, I, I like it. So go ahead. You were telling me you were in the process of transferring the Schizotech tapes. Let's. Well, um, ever, yeah, I, I, since... I kind of put a memorial, uh, a short memorial in the last Space Basement Collective release on Archive. And I ever... think, I, I think it'd be a, a okay. nice if you just took a moment and, and, uh, and talked about him and well, the tapes that you did uh... together, and then we'll move on to uh, okay. the history of, because he's also part of it as well, because he was in Billy's Masonic Tavern. As yeah, he was. Gets attack and he, and was he, a, he and... was he was a poet about town in the in our collective scene, and um, yeah, that that I guess that's what he meant to me is, you know, uh, as far as that goes, is he was he was part of our brotherhood and and um, yeah, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, that that's I think that's that's in a in a. Um... And sorry for springing this on you, but I think that it it would be right. a failure if we didn't start by mentioning him. Okay, well, all right. Well, Jim, what in, in, in one slice of his life, uh, that's exactly who he was, definitely. And that's what he was, he was up to. I mean, I, I met him in uh, September of 2000, and um, he was the, the Niagara Artists Company janitor, um, paid janitor, but also a working artist member in the building. <clears throat> and then he, uh, and then him and I, we were both going to the same poetry reading, somebody else's, like, thing going on or whatever. This one guy named Luke Woodard had his own, you know, reading. Uh, he dubbed Voices in Your Head. And we, we both attended the reading. We became friends. And over the course of a few years, various, uh, like, jamming lineups with, with me and him and other people in the mix. It just got down to just to just me and him, and he had a particular vision. And um, in his on his path, like developing his 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 ability, he he he, he taught himself home recording. He taught himself um, music concrete, and he taught himself uh, like a lot of a lot of interesting things, you know, to do with home rock, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, like in this, in the sense where you where you don't really know what it is you're doing, but you know you're doing it, and you're having a good time with it. It's meaningful to you. So he was doing all these things in his own little world, in his own bubble. And um, but some of that breached this the uh, the you know the exterior, and and it became art in a way because it, because he was able to express himself beyond the confines of just the the workshed, per se. Right, right. Like to start with, that's exactly what 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 happened with with him and I working together in, in this it's attack. He just came at me conversationally one day with, well, I, you know, he wanted to have a band, and 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 I was like, well, yeah, that'd be a great idea. And and I was in, I was already in, <laughs> or had been in, how many? And I just said, well, yeah, okay, well, let's do that, and then. But he, but then this was, this was, um, uh, there was, you know, there's, there's more to a house than a door. So, you know, when I walked in, it, it was this whole, he had this whole scheme. He had this whole idea and he had an idiosyncratic. Like it was fully realized in his head. Well, what he a lot of it, a lot of it was and a lot of it wasn't. And where in the certain parts where it wasn't in that linear way psychologically i that's where i came in to really help him realize what he was doing um because he was on and you know on his own momentum anyway right mm -hmm. so then what so then it, and then there was other parts of the concept where where we just sat we just talked about it kind of thing and i did the whole um you know i just did the whole what if thing at him 
and, and it jogged him. And it, it was a catalyst. And there's a catalyst between two minds when you get two people in the room together and you can work. And and that's what we had. And that's what was going on. And that's what really made the album happen. It was, yeah. it was that. Um, but pri primarily, though, of course, it was the concept he had. Like, Schizotech was, uh, is a conceptual album of of his account of a fictional character who I think goes through a, um, kind of like an equilateral kind of um, kind of a similar experience to what you know real you know real life quote unquote crazy people do mm -hmm. and and then there's a lot of um, there's a lot of things that can that can come out of that in terms of that person's expression. Right, and that's what Jim did. He really put that on the map, as far as uh, in terms of being an artist, not to pigeonhole himself, but but just to sort of inter introductory. Really. So, I guess create an, something to to just knock it down later, iconoclastically. Right. And then that's where we come to the two albums, these two these two all follow up albums that we did, kind of thing. That that they then in, the, in themselves are both conceptual and um but loose at the same time mm -hmm. and uh and it's been a, it's been a gas just doing it because we, we have i have a tape that i've held on to for about 15 years and then recently i just digitized both albums that exist on you know um respectively on both sides of, of the tape that's and, fantastic um, and so i think so i think what's going to happen is is that stuff will get released subsequently but the other things from all these different, because I have a small cache, like a small, like little treasure chest of things, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep unveiling things as I go. Um, and again, I mean, he he really was his own thing. He really was his own momentum uh, as an artist, you know. Um, not to compare um, Talking Heads, but but the way in which um, Bowie was never um, a hand manipulator or, or a or the progenitor of Iggy's efforts as an artist. It's the same thing with me, Jim and I. He was, he was really his own thing as an artist, as a person doing his doing his stuff. And I and I just I just I just helped him out. You know what I mean? And I was glad to be in that capacity more more so than if it were a 50-50 collaboration or something right. where where I was going to carry him or he was going to carry me or whatever. That sort of that sort of thing. It's the details of that that made it that really made it interesting. Yeah, yeah. You know where I was good with. All right, you want me to, to you know, you want me to play blue? I'll play blue. Or or, you know, the sunset. You know, looks like this over the tree. Okay, let's. Where's the keyboard? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. so it was it was really that it was really that kind of it's and it's really left field music like it's really out of the way of of home rock in a lot of ways to be honest and and really it's just the, the that kind of experimental stuff like years ago around the same time that I had started working with Jim on Schizotech I had seen a documentary about this guy from the states who calls himself Jandek and he's this really eccentric idiosyncratic reclusive isolated but at the same time connected to a world community sort of guy who just put a, puts out these really you know you know whatever navel gazing sort of kind of music but they really really if you just sit back and you listen to them it's like wow it's a really different perspective than than what people would consider most um indie or underground music to be yeah kind um, of proto avant-garde yeah, well, even in the even if they are working with pop riffs and rock chords, yeah, too, in the same or the similar type of range, arrangements musically. Yeah. So, so, so that really was a really that was a really big insight into into working with Jim was to observe other outsider artists like him. That, that again, it just because it's so um, quickly and easily misunderstandable doesn't mean that it doesn't have a significant. That's why I believe, I guess, in that sort of material. And this was definitely that, Schizotech was deaf and, and Sick Puppy was definitely that material. Mm -hmm. And so I think we had a good go of it. And, this, and, I'm, and I'm happy to, uh, to document it and I'm happy to, to archive it in, in terms of his memorial because I think yeah. he's, 
you know, it's like what ha it's like it's honestly like I have to cite history in a lot of ways. It's like what happens when, uh, you know, 20 years later, people, you know, finally listen to everybody who said, oh, yeah, you know, the Velvet Underground, you know, was yeah. a really important band or this or Suicide was a really important band. Or, 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 or Scott Walker was a really, you know, underrated vocalist or something. It's, it's, it's about the intrinsic qualities that people find in, in their music. And it's this thing where if you really love something, like if you really love, you know, a kind of a, a kind of a music that influences yourself, you really, you really dig deep and you really get into the nitty gritty of that artist. And and as much as I really dig anything that's ever influenced me or inspired me, I think Jim was definitely like I was also a fan of him mm -hmm. at the same time. We were fans of each other. Well, I think you need to be to produce it. Like yeah. Like and I remember the excitement yeah. when uh, you and Jim came over with the sick. Uh, when you came, because I, I, this is my own my small part of this. Very very small part of this was um, you guys did the uh, first bounce to digital from his little his little four track recorder in my old office next across the street and um i still remember that afternoon where we just sat there everything was done you had all your levels you knew what you needed to do as you um recorded it down and and mm -hmm. and uh uh we did the transfer directly from four track to i think 128 mp3 at the time because the you know computers were slower um <laughs> but if i recall we didn't yeah, do yeah. much we didn't do any, and this is why i don't take any credit for it, we didn't do any any post-production on the computer we essentially did the same conversion that you're doing now only from the from the cassette masters that you had done so well, that engineering is still important i think i think that's still i mean that's what that's what the i mean i i recognize that definitely the, the value of that yeah and any and any persons like yourselves in that role you know i mean they got a what they got a they got a they got a wayne kramer or whatever his name is eddie kramer documentary coming out he's an engineer he engineered tons of stuff and and it's usually producers or the artists themselves who who are you know who are considered to be the most um productive or effective in those scenarios when that really is the myth or whatever the engineers are the, are just as important yeah. Because, because that's, you know. Well, on a side note, you think of like Michael Beinhorn and, and, and Herbie Hancock, where, you know, that relationship, you know, you know, as, as, as this rap engineer originally out of New York City, and it's probably mischaracterizing Mr. Beinhorn, because uh, he went on to do so much other stuff as well. But, you know, was tapped because he was young and talented and Herbie wanted to do something that wasn't avant-garde jazz. And, and, and then of course, you know, they ended up winning Grammys and all this stuff and yeah, the whole yeah. career. Um, well, you know, like, yeah, like in mainstream pop. I mean, obviously Herbie Hancock was already accomplished way before that. But oh, um, yeah. yeah, but I, I guess that this is a nice segue as well because I, I know that the last Schizotech show turned into the first year of the Rat show and and you essentially had, now, now to be, for those that are out there, the Home Rock, jam scene had been going on for probably eight or ten years already within the city um probably yeah. and but and you had a group of friends that you'd been working with under various different names and and you you and i talked about this yesterday about how you're like i guess i'm in a band now <laughs> and it well, was totally improv um okay. but well, so okay. i'm kind of jumping so, around but but so the year of the rat came out of uh needing a name at l3 for a, a gig and that's where well, the year of the rat name came from you see this is such a big this is such a this is not just one onion but it's a bag of them. i know i know I'm, that's what i'm doing on purpose to just kind of get and you know kind of and I'm, light the fire <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a it's a bag of onions, <laughs> and, bag of onions. and it smells <laughs> and it's and it's purple and rotting no it's um no okay well what the what the deal was is I think chronologically, the way that I did, I'm going to set it up like this. Okay. Uh, I'm from Toronto, but I moved to St. Catharines, and I arrived in May of 1990, 1996. Um, within two years of living there, 
I discovered the scene. I was, I became a part of it. Um, I was working with it, within it, and working with the people within it. And oh, and uh, I found my way into a band, and I was from the, from the, uh, my internet connection's unstable. Yeah, you're, you're, you, I, I lost a little bit of what you just said. So if you could just repeat that, everything's okay, fine. Carry so, on. It just, it, yeah, yeah. it's so recovered, my, but you had a blip. Yeah, I found my way into a band and, and being at that time, um, I think I was, I was 21 and, and being at that time, I, I, my notion of a band was a rock band. It was a, a band that played songs. It was a band that did material and rehearsed and, and wrote and recorded and all these other things you know like i've heard on albums for years and years and years no matter what the music was and this was this was interesting and new because it was a band where we didn't do anything like that at all yeah we we made stuff up but we never stuck to it so basically we improv and we jammed all the time and that band was called unusual species and i was in that group for nine months out of the year in uh, 1998 and, and we gigged quite a lot. I think there were about, I think we played like 30 gigs in that year, in that nine months or something like that. I've got it written down, but actually, but because uh, I made a, a musician CD recently. But so nice. that's was, to me, that was the first experience, real, um, like aside from say an open stage at the club in 1996. Or, or any other assorted jam happening in 1997 or wherever, mm-hmm. um, like underneath the, the gallery across the street from Kazas, for example, in 1997, right. you know, a couple times. But Deep down in the basement. Yeah, that one, the double basement thing. Yeah. Yeah. So in so in '98, and with unusual playing with unusual species, and as as being the guitarist and and the form, one of the two formative members, um, that's where I that's where I first started knowing what that was basically um because even bands that did that that i heard on record they didn't they didn't just you know like those songs were those velvet underground songs although heavily influenced by being improvisational and and being influenced by the avant-garde were, were written um and so we didn't write anything right <laughs> so that's every every friday night uh get together was a jam and every time we ever played live was a jam and that was we did that for nine months in 1998 and then later on there were a few off in you know off one-off moments here and there were in 1999 where um and in 2000 um where i did some of that and in 2001 and um and then that's when I, and then, and then in 2001, that's when I became acquainted with the Billy's Masonic Tavern. And, and these were a group of musicians who, similar to what I had done earlier with Unusual Species, they were doing that all the time and, and also recording it. And like, and just having an open stage at, at various venues that they could either rent or sort of like take over. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to get Jacob John v- Vrieswick, um, uh, Lord Open is his stage name to do a similar kind of interview as this because he'll be able to go deeper into where the scene was um, before I, you and I met at the club back in 96. Um, yeah. But yeah. I, I do know f- from BMT started at, I, from what I understand, West Hill Tavern, and then they moved to being the house band of the Knack for a while. And that, well, yeah, and that that's picks the, it up to where you are. So yeah, carry on. Well, well yeah, that's that's the thing. That's what happened around two thousand two one, or at the end of two thousand, or in early of two thousand. Right away, actually, it was January of two thousand two. They became the proprietors of the space at Dubon Street, the old Niagara, Niagara Artist Center. Yeah. And then they started running their their open mic, open jam, open stage recorded sessions. So so there was the two different point of views in that way there was that one and then there was the one that i'd known previous to knowing what they were doing in unusual species where you just had like five people on stage and we were always and every gig was always just made up you know yeah that sort of deal um but not but not like the grateful dead or not like not that you know not that sort of thing it was our own 
thing and our and other you know and i think interesting what we thought were interesting influences involved um and what we were doing was the most important thing right and um so then so then so then uh i guess in my recollection of it you know 2001 2002 and three there was some jamming on going on but then but then for like another you know for two or three years 2000 and um, you know up until 2000 around 2005 really nothing going on at all no bmt no no bands like unusual species or any of the you know kind of different stuff no jamming no nothing and then um and then i found my way and then i was invited into a jam by a guy named wade Faf, uh to join up with greg gunn this guy greg gunn and that you know and you know you know greg right so it's like yep. yeah and uh and these guys were doing like a blues rock kind of like old school whatever kind of jam yeah like and him and his brother jared were just doing it out of jared's garage which I think to this day they're probably well, still meeting on Fridays. <laughs> well, what? No, well, no, actually, no. This is before today. that. Oh, no, this is before. Well, that. well, what happened was Wade, Wade, uh, Wade came up to me in Mikados, and he okay. told me that him and Greg and I was like, oh, I know Greg, that they were jamming the two of them. Okay. And that okay. They were so this is even before the garage jams. Gotcha. Yeah, this was a, Wade had a had an apartment on Chatham, uh, so he was so he was running it out of his house. Cool. And having Greg coming over, or or they would go over to the garage if if the garage was available, you know. Okay. Yeah. So basically, um, so basically, I got I got, and Jared actually wasn't even involved at that point. It was like this guy Mike Wilton, who I knew and worked with at Star Records, and, and hung around with at Star Records. He was hanging with them and and jamming with them, but then he was out, and then it was Wade and just Greg, and then I was in. And then it was the three of us for like the longest time. Sometimes Jared was there. Sometimes Steve Siansky was there as well. Uh, and sometimes Reg Heitzman was, was there as well. Uh, and then it would go back and forth between the garage and Wade's. And then it eventually just went to the, it was only at the garage. And it got to the point where it got kind of boring. And then what I did is I, I I talked with Greg about it and I said to him, well, I want to like liven things up and make it more interesting, like for us, like mm -hmm. to play, like for what we're playing and what it sounds like. And um, because at that point I was recording it all myself. I at, from that point forward at the garage that in 2005, that's when I started recording things just for the hell of it, you know, because we were coming up with interesting things and that was an excite an exciting prompt emotionally to sort of capture it um you know the idea that we weren't making that we were making things up on the spot and it was a jam and it wasn't like a band or it wasn't right. like a you know particular particular uh specified creative um objective so so we started so i started recording it on a, on a digital video camera and i called in some people that i knew from the bmt group who I knew were still in St. Catharines. So, and, and then what happened is that started to swell over a period of two or three years. While I was doing Schizotech, while I was in other bands and other projects and doing, having other enthusiasms. And then, and then one day, ta-da, and that's what happened. This guy named Josh Supan, who is a local, a local um, youngster impresario band manager and promoter, Mm -hmm. He offered me a gig, like he offered the gig to me as far as whatever I was doing at the time. Right, like here's a slot on the stage. You want in? Yeah. And I said, yeah, I want in. And um, and um, but I couldn't do Schizotech because for for one reason or another, and I didn't want to. Um, I actually didn't want to pass up the opportunity to actually play the gig. So what I did is I thought, well. I'll just hand pick whoever's available, whoever wants to show up, and I'll just have the live jam that we do, like on the stage of this, in the you know, on the stage of this venue in the slot of this live, you know, like gig, like right. this actual like official traditional. Like you don't, you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. Even in even yeah. in the so called you know indie community, that's a no no. That gets you kicked out of places. Maybe even like, you know, maybe at knife point. I don't know. But, 
you know, well, maybe if it's in the States, but it's, but it's so, but I did it anyway. And, and John Breeswick and, and Greg Gunn showed up and the three of us hit the stage. And then uh, Chandra Murray showed up to watch to Kim come in. Effervescent, and, uh, although she yeah. hasn't put anything out in a while, but effervescent. Yeah, effervescent, she showed up. And, but then um, later on, she got up and joined us for the second half of the set. And that was, and I dubbed the, the, the gig, the band, Year of the Rat, because it was actually the Chinese Year of the Rat. That was the last cycle. In fact, right. Cycle. And it's, and it is Year of the Rat now, well, which is, so it's apropos that we're starting, we're kicking off this uh, interview series. <laughs> well, there you go. That's a good, yeah. that's a good, that's a good um, premonition for sure, if anything. Um, so then after that, we were, we were, I built up a concept out of not creating anything, but just sort of kind of like sitting back and just sort of like, like listening to, um, or just kind of taking in what we were doing. And it, and I, and then I guess I suppose the rest is well, internet documented history as far as what we, what it was. And, and, and I think what it was is that there was this idea of, of live performance, and this idea of improvisational music and this idea of, of but having a band dynamic similar to the same type of band that does songwriting, but without the songwriting, but with all these other things thrown in instead. Yeah. And that was a development in a way where it, it did become a conceptual art music group collective, most likely centric to music, but but definitely dedicated to just you know, being, um, you know, are making our own rules, doing it our own way, pretty much. And then, and then, you know, and then that to me is, is, is essentially what, what that, those kind of like peripheral energies and then through, um, you know, actions of my own, but also actions of other people to kind of like bring it all together into this one kind of focused sort of, um, Attitude. It's an attitude, and and it like like the way that punk is in isn't a sound. It's a it's a, thing, a method of thinking. Yeah. A way of thinking about things. Um, and I think that's exactly what Year of the Rat and Jam Rock and Home Rock and Open Stage and Open Source and all of it to me just singles down to one basic, you know, newly discovered and in, <laughs> and innovated upon sort of element. That I seem to that I seem to be able to catch on to, um, you know, uh, in terms of you know along the path of my artistic pursuits, and I was able to kind of uh, get a little bigger than just anything self-indulgent in terms of being an artist about it. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's what your other ad is. I think that's exactly what what, what we ended up. As. Yeah, I mean, like, I think that I've said this before, I think the closest analogy in with commercial success is probably broken social scene. And then in that that is ostensibly the entire yeah, Toronto weird... established music scene, doing something similar to this, where they get together and put an album out every couple of years. But the difference there is that it has some, it, it's actually probably broken social scene is probably closer to what Tom Waits does, where he just gets people in a room and start singing his song and, and then, the and then yeah. people figure it out right it, it, I, it yeah. still has some musical direction yeah i think i think but i think for it to be that um immediate and that urgent and even that casual is a good idea like in yeah. terms of in terms of making stuff and i think and with that large of a group of people i think that's really wonderful dynamics as well that's yeah. another thing and so that's what Ear of the Rat became. Ear of the Rat became this this sort of almost like, you know, these are all the people like me <laughs> kind of thing. They're yeah. all the outsider artists of various levels and in this little microcosmic scene. And and we're doing the we're doing you know, like it's you know, it it's you know, it's even it's not the Beatles, it's not the Rolling Stones, and it's, and it's, and it's deeper than the Velvet Underground. Yeah. Sort of attitude, right? And, and, uh, and that, that was, that was a really cool niche to, to create 
pretty much, in a, in a, especially in a place like St. Catharines, with the weird sort of history that it has culturally, mm-hmm. and also, um, and also oddly enough, in a scene where you know, like wow, like we're at, and then you know, just the sort of the self discovery where we kind of kind of did realize that we were kind of on the on the precipice of like the vanguard. Yeah, I mean, like, there's the other thing is we're like, well, this is the thing that I find kind of exciting because we have like, like at the, just be, you know, around ninety one, ninety two, we had Intersound Accelerator, we had Mersey, who were doing something similar, but they were more like shoegaze, quasi improvisational in, in projects. Ninety one, ninety one. Yeah, I, w- I maybe ninety. I'm probably I'm probably a couple of years behind there. Probably. Um, no, I think I got my years mixed up. Actually, I'm thinking more of um, um, 94, 95, actually. I think. Oh, okay, right, right, okay. right. 91, actually going back to 91, 92, I mean, then you've got like Magna Cum Laude, which, but then from Magna Cum Laude, you've got uh, the side projects really more than anything. Uh, John Press's Dinner is Ruined, which, and I've talked about this, I, I talked to you this about you offline, uh, Dinner's Ruined actually became Gord Downey's backing band when Gord Downey did the two, you know, did his solo projects. Oh, when he did his solo, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. And that, I just yeah. find that fascinating because, you know, the Dinner's Ruined stuff wow. was was proto, it was improvised stuff as well. So, yeah, yeah. which is just to say, we weren't doing, and 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 Guelph has this huge improvisational music scene that has actually not jazz, but actual improvisational rock music scene. That, oh, yeah. um, and I know there's a connection there. Uh, uh, with some members that uh, that um, uh, to the previous to Billy's Masonic Tavern more than yeah. Ear the Rat, um, but I that well, that's the the larger conversation I find fascinating is that there's this yeah. huge scene of open stages in Ontario and op- and home rock in Ontario of of let's get together and record what we're doing in the basement. Well, that, it is it is similar to the punk thing and the idea or the or yeah. that sort of like thing that happened with all those bands in the 80s that we never heard of you know until the 90s where right. where there were these little you're the only person in your town who likes you know whoever that's not necessarily the main taste or the main or the main um preference of most people even of, of those who are allegedly hip Right. And, and, and then you find each other and then you somehow, you know, I don't want to do that. This sucks. You want to hang out and do not do this. Okay. Yeah. You know, right. and then music gets made out of that sometimes, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Amongst, you know, other things, I mean, you know, partying and whatever else, I suppose, or just the general socialization, but right. it's the truth. I think, and I think that that's the sort of, that's the sort of kind of thing that, the jam rock and home rock stuff is it's not necessarily political either i mean that's the funniest yeah. thing yeah and it, and it, 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 and i don't think it's a genre out. in and of itself right because yeah. i mean certainly there are a ton of improv rock bands that come out of the jam scene that that yeah. you know certainly we owe a lot to um well, you know and and i'm not going to make any fish jokes or anything like that either i mean i mean it with full no, earnestness no, no. I mean, right but yeah, but like, there, it, it's not the genre we're talking about it's you know the same guys that were were rocking out to the grateful dead and then just would spend you know which many of our band members past and present had done were coming from that school of jamming like yeah. like i don't pretend that we invented any of this it's just um well, I, I just find it, this no, awesome. I think, I, That's all. Well, I think it's. I think. It, I think in some ways there was. There it was. I think it's a time. It's. It's. You see, that's the thing. The weird thing about this sort of invention or non-invention stuff. I. I contemplate this sort of thing too. Yeah. And 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 I think that I. I didn't really invent anything either. I mean, I just. I was at the right place at the right time, and I made the right connections between the so-called dots. Yeah. And what I was experiencing. And and also, but I was taking in what other people were doing, right? I was seeing yeah. where it all started or stopped and who was still, I was really, you know, like, um, if I can't, if I don't get money, you know, uh, cred points for, for what I do, technically, at least I make up for it in terms of being a motivator and a, and a catalyst and somebody yeah. who makes things happen and 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 brings other people into it, you know? Um, yeah. in that way 
Well, I mean, like, like that's something I find, I, I, like, I guess what I'm getting at is I find it fascinating yeah. that what we did was we took the same principles that are used in blues improv, like, um, like the Grateful Dead did, does, bluesing yeah. Americana improv, and applied it to Krautrock <laughs> and shoegaze and noise rock. And, well, and I mean, that's what, you know. It's experimental chef time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd, but I'd the same say, principles, I'd, yeah. you know, instead of starting with an eight bar or 12 bar blues or a folk turnaround, Just like the Grateful Dead would do, we were more starting from a blank slate or, or and I'm not, like I said, it, it, it really came out of ignorance, I think, of music theory. <laughs> <laughs> that we're oh. like, let's just make some noise, or you know, and and influences like psychic TV and 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 uh, and craft work that well, that the various bunch. members had, right? Well, again, like I said, think chef yeah, time. That, I, yeah, exactly, exactly. Because I don't think it necessary. I mean, I stopped believing in in the little boxes or pockets of what genres are and what they mean and and the power yeah. of. That's so transitory. It's so not permanent. It's so temporary as music history shows right yep. and that it's a sound or a few then the feeling from that sound that seems to resonate with people in terms of the first couple bars of their seconds of whatever it so i so i think that's where we were coming from we were coming from a very a more intuitive place right um in terms of that kind of and i find i do find to be you know certain groups like craft work you know oddly enough and psychic tv to be intuitive groups more than they would be anything other you know like what i hear what comes into my in my ears from the from the headphones is that is the magic of that kind of intuitive you know otherness and and, and i think that's what we were doing i yeah. think that's what the whole deal was because it's hard it's hard i, I tried it myself i tried being in, in a band and i yeah. couldn't i couldn't have done it i couldn't do it you know i was like i didn't care how much the guys from the strange liked me <laughs> to be yeah. to want me to be in there i tried to be in the band one time and i just said no nah, i can't, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know how to play big mouth strikes again the right way um anyway but but uh <laughs> <laughs> that's another story <laughs> yeah no, but but there's but there is that thing where where it's a it's a really other other thing. It's it's like maybe um, comparative to in a, maybe in a sense too in terms of the attitudinal base, it, it, like the no wave scene in New York. Right. Yeah. Like, the, like that's really concretely abstract blocks of sound kind of stuff. Right. And, and then and then I think we were we were open to that as much as we were open to anything like what you're describing. You know. I mean, to be fair, to be honest, yeah, you know, about it, because we did have a, a quite a plethora of people and quite a plethora of sounds and styles and mixtures and all like you know, biosphering in the same room together. Yeah, you know, and I think that that that's what there was an energy that came out of that that became the discovery, and thus the I innovated more. And I think the word is innovated more than invented, but I right. definitely innovated on that and pushed it in. I, you know, it's like surfs up. Here comes the wave. <laughs> You're right. I'm getting, on, I'm getting on that board, and I'm and I'm definitely gonna gonna see how far and how high, you know. And I think that's what it was. It, there was something, an element of that too. And I think we kind of all felt it. I know. I know at the time, John and I felt it when we when him and I would just sit and talk right. about what was going on and and verses, and we compared the notes experientially. <laughs> yeah like what i find fascinating about it is is that what i find <laughs> yeah and and what i find fascinating about it that i actually just going back through the archive uh, at literallyarchive.org but going through our audio archives and it going back further is you know i didn't realize it at the time but i be, i think because of jacob john's um pre past literally doing the lord open radio show um he always kind of looked at it as though we were doing, I guess now we would call it a podcast, but at the time, well, you know, well, and, and that, that even yeah, before we that. start, even before you set up yeah. the, the, the video camera and well, even before good... we started webcamming it online, yeah. it was, yeah. you know, the space base, you know, live from the space base, you're the rat, you know, and, and 
he, you know, his MC callouts were station IDs. You know, they were they were basically station IDs. Well, I that, thought well, that was fascinating. A, well, that's because that guy is more of a radio guy than he ever was in bands. Yeah. Uh, to, th then that's what I know. He's yep. he's a he's a bedroom, you know, basement kind of musician, and but he but he's more of a radio guy, and I think that's what happened because the, he does, because there is this other parallel thing, of course. I will. Yeah, and that's the other, and that's the other part that, of, and, and yeah, exactly. And I'll be talking with Jacob John about that, that other yeah. aspect of it where it came out of you know the you know he, he, the, him and Sulikowski's uh, psychic somatic climax machine and then lord open after that and uh the rate lord open radio hour after that and then the broadcasts of bmt on brock radio that yeah. were happening semi-regularly yeah. and then from there the broadcast to the internet of eotr originally well, on archive.org well, and again this is what happens is that there's it's a multimedia uh right show, it's right? always been a multimedia project always, yeah it's always encompassed all these different things like the perform and yeah, even and, and, and that's not to mention that's not to mention or your broadcasting rather and and I'm talking on the moment I talked for a moment about the multimedia aspect yours and Tom's uh, uh, graphics uh, as well I mean all Fine. over <laughs> well I was thinking of your collages I was oh, thinking right. specifically okay. of your collages but of Tom's well, of Tom's like, I like uh, Tom's video crazy over. yeah crazy uh um kind of boing boing-esque uh well it's you know, zine style it's cartoons film i think yeah i think it's it's just home movies but but if you yep. had to but if you had to get intellectual about it it's like i call it transgressive where it's film that's influenced by transgressive film stuff you know like the, yeah it, i actually really love what the postman's been doing lately with uh with sb5 with the with the the the, the new uh, 2020 project he's been bringing in his cassette deck you know the one he used to use to, when he delivered the mail yeah. and he's got all these old samples all over the place on it samples of himself uh, samples of movies well, uh, again, prank phone calls yeah, and yeah. he's you know, and he's got his own mixing hmm. board that we 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 pipe into this guy yeah. and it's amazing that just the stuff that we're coming up with now that it's well, you, that he's yeah. coming up with it's, it's freaking brilliant <laughs> and he's you and he's using a chaos ball. pad now um <laughs> yeah it, w some great things happening um, well that's no okay, and it's well it's true you don't get that in rock and roll and that's what yep. that's what the whole that's what that's why that's what um that's the great the great adventure right you shall take to the skies <laughs> no, but um, but it's just, but that's what it is in terms of in terms of creativity is that you've got all these other you've got all these different toys or tools in the box. You've got sound on sound. You've got samples. You've got noise. You've got minimal. You've got prog. You've got whatever synth. You've got uh, stylistic th influence. So and and that's great. I mean, no rules. Like a, it's a freedom. It's a it's a it's a really neat existential freedom freedom at work. And I think yep. that that's that's a really and that's that's a fundamental thing because because a lot, there's a lot of artists that that make their art and they don't really get to work that freely. You know, even even if it's even if it is, um, you know, even if it is whoever. That's, that's that's really kind of you know special or interesting, you know. Some some do, some don't. It's it's it 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 varies, I guess. But but that's the freedom that we enjoyed, and that's the one that's the thing that I really liked about that because that's what the beauty is. Because that's like cassette tapes and stuff. Like I love that kind of stuff. I used to play yeah. with that stuff when I was a kid, just just to make myself laugh. <laughs> right, right. And stuff and that and that sort of a fascination happens. So that it's neat to bring all of those things into the mix, just so it to, just so it's it's uh, it's interesting. Because I mean that's the thing about making this sort of music. You know, it's about making it interesting for yourself. Because there's no expectation of an audience. There's no, um, you know, there's no and and so there's a freedom there. And so once you have, once you know that you can walk away from that plane crash creatively if, if, if it's deemed in any way a failure you're thusly more empowered and more um in tune to really come up with something interesting knowing that you could just 
ditch it again and again. <laughs> and that's right. what this whole improvisational thing is. And that's what sampling is about too. And that's right. what all these, it's just, it's about to be able to, to do that sort of, that sort of thing your own way, you know? And that's what make great art is either, either, either inadvertently or accidentally or rather quite intentionally. And, and it's strange because I think in Ear of the Rat and I think for Home Rock's sake, there, there is a quasi, uh, or there's a, there is a balance or something. There is some sort of an equilibrium there between the two points of view that way mm -hmm. in terms of the ambition for it, you know, because you really have to be ambitious to, to, you know, to do like a one man clang band, clang clang metal right. band or something, you know, out in, you know, public or even to, because it is, You'd be, there actually is a realistic sort of, like, we got weird, like, you know, back when I was an unusual species, for example, even though I was starting out and I was younger, there was this weird, people like looked at us funny, not because of the way we looked or anything like that, but because we were going to, well, what songs are you going to play? Right. Or we're not. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 well, what's this guy, this isn't an amp or a guitar, what is that? It's a tape deck. Oh, right. So, right. so that's the. There's a difference. There is a very discernible difference between between it's in terms of like the the intentions and the attitudes versus what we know as music. Right. There's actually. A, I think David Byrne may have, may have written about this. I, I haven't read his book about listening to music or music itself, but 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 you know there is that consideration. I think. And I, and I think in Era of the Rat definitely took something out of that consideration. We made that a part of the music. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think David Byrne's a really good example because he's always been at, at the uh, the forefront of audiovisual. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think his current stage show is they just, now that wireless technology is at a point where you can uh, reliably trust it, his entire, his current, uh, his current touring band is entirely wireless. He's got, and and they're a dance. Tr they're made of musicians who are also dancers. Um, you can look it up online. I'm I'm not here to plug David Byrne, but what he's doing is really neat. You know, they, cool. they come out on stage and he's got like five drummers doing like like marching band type stuff, but it's all performed. You know, you know he's performing. Um, uh, you know he's performing his old songs, and yet at the same time, they're, uh, you know, they're they're new and they're fresh, and and he's doing performance art while he's while he's doing the song. He had a performance on Saturday Night Live late uh, late last year, I think it was. Oh, no, cool. Okay. Up, but anyways, yeah, I haven't I haven't caught up. It's on the YouTube. You could find it on the yeah. YouTube. <laughs> so okay, so I think so I think like. Um, um, okay, and then the other angle of this whole thing too, of this whole experience with Jamrock, and 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 again, it's it's about trying to do things your own way. Because the, I mean, even now, even after even like the '80s and the and the '90s, even after you know the early 2000s, there still is that I think, and maybe this is just a biased point of view because I'm I'm an older person now, but yeah, but I you know there is still that thing that that the musician is. Is, a, is sort of on a like to like to to do that or to be that when you're not that is like this thing on a platform of uh you know it's something to sort of ascend to right and the beauty of this sort of attitude about music is that you don't need to do that you can just go from home you can do your right you know you can record from home you can you know you can you can do a <clears throat> you know i mean people are doing and the media and media is a wonderful technological media is a, is a great uh, role to play in that because of handheld, you know, iPhones that can record video and you can right. like, get your acoustic guitar and do a song and then just put it up on the internet just like, just like that. And right. then, so that I think that's, there's something, there's something, there's something really relevant where, where the merge, where that sort of weird otherness, other, yeah, I mean, genre aside, Billie it, Eilish it started makes, as home rock, right? Her and her brother is doing stuff. Sure, yeah, exactly. Yeah, arguably, you know, yeah. in terms of that theoretical point of view. Like, as so, far as going back to the spirit of 
DIY specifically, you know, although obviously, yeah. obviously she had some label connections that were able to get her some exposure, but, but yeah, no, I mean, represent for her. I mean, yeah. Or, or the shags, yep. right. The sisters, right. Yep. That kind of, that kind of thing, or, or even, um, you know, you know, so, so it's that, so the, you know, so it's, so there is that thing where the, the media make really merges mesh as well with that kind of, the freedom from that sort of outsider kind of point of view of being right. able to really, really, really like more, more so than previous eras or generations really own your own um, art house, I guess, or yeah. music house or whatever. Yep. And I think, and I think that that's, what's really cool about Dear the Rat. That's what we had. That's what we did. And I think that that, that, that that's, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it. I think there was there was a reluctance on my part, for example, um, in 2005, leading up to 2008, where I didn't. I no longer wanted to even play in, in conventional rock bands anymore, mm -hmm. or anything like that. And I found that this, that the way out of a rut, musical rut, in a sense, and into some new way to have an experience musically, but also inform that that more conventional work at the same time was to go off and, and give up bands and go and jam and do that open source broadcasting, recorded, multimedia, improv, experimental, multi-diverse stylistic thing. Mm -hmm. and, and just to do that, just to come up with the ideas, just to come up with the ideas and come up with the ideas. And, and then they're all over the, the floor and then you kind of work with them or don't work with them or you can let people other people work because it's open source you can also let other people work with them or not work with them and it's just yeah. the idea of generating generating like this um and it's all still there i mean we can we have thousands of hours literally thousands of hours well, of music about, on archive.org that's licensed creative yeah. commons that people can splice re you know slice up splice up and and remix it's information and, and, and all they need and to do is acknowledge GOTR1. Well, it's information, but it's not just information. It's information that is or leading to ideas. Right. And, and I'm a, and I'm a huge, you know, kind of fan or whatever. And, and person who takes seriously what the guy says, what David Lynch says about ideas and ideas are these nuggets of gold. They are these pieces of thought and or information. They're fragments or whole, things that we invent or innovate on or discover mm -hmm. and 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 with you know the rat we had a, a machine we made a machine we made a, a a way of creating a infinitely sustainable energy source that created ideas right and an infinite amount of ideas that could be you know and that i think that's what it really what, to me that's what it boils down to if, if i had any ambition in it and I certainly did. I'll, I'll admit it for sure. Um, that that's what I. That that's what I. That that's the real, the value of the, the thing that I really got into is the idea that you know this thing that we were doing. A way like like just to, like the like the thing that radiated off of it, right? The thing that wafted off of it or that residually oozed out of it were these ideas, musical ideas. Sound right. ideas, songs, structures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but all of the pieces, all over the floor. You know, in ten minutes we'd go from like one thing to another, but then it's not just ten minutes we're jamming for six hours the whole night, right? So if you just look at that over what that's what that's doing, and over a long such a long period of time of documentation and broadcasting, that's huge, right? And that's and that's the and that's and I think that's what the real accomplishment is is that we created this huge um like space or, or field of, of of ideas right and and that and that's that's and the ideas weren't just um uh they're they, they're it wasn't so much the, the, uh, the two things were two factors were highly represented there the quality as much as the quantity too Right, and and because we were doing this otherness, we were doing this other this other left field more than left field left field music, and even combined, but then throwing in 
conventional stuff too, right? I think that's what I think that's why this thing needs to be documented in, in to such a degree, right? And and even to some degree conditionally upon certain ideas that came about of it, um, and, and of, of course perspectives and things like that, because there because that's 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 like a that's like a rarity I think in culture. Yeah, and and that's why I wanted to kind of have this sort of retrospective of of you know something that you know we all did <laughs> and 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 sure it was well, fun we and it was a way of, of spending we a Friday. All, yeah, we were all a part and, of it. Yeah. But I mean, I think it's pretty. You know, the fact that we did you know almost six years of recording in, in every Friday, we did three years of broadcasting every Friday um, via UStream when that was before that was. Uh, yeah took over by IBM. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a body of work. Well, that, uh, well, and, it is, it, it, it became, it, it's an, it, it's an inadvertent one too, because it yeah, wasn't meant accidental. to be, yeah, it was completely because it was, you know, from 2005 up and up until uh, 2008, it was just mucking around. Right. And then from 2008, and under the guise of that discovery or innovative concept or whatever, and this innovated the discovery and then the innovation upon it, and then there's a concept that comes out of that. And then, like, it was really an organic thing. It was really just something that happened. Right. And, and I think that that was really cool. There was no like, concentrated, like, thing in, in a sense, in that way, where, okay, you know, there's a couple, we're, we're going to make up this band. <laughs> like yeah. it wasn't like that it wasn't like suits and, and executives in an office but at the same time it wasn't like this home cooked up thing either right it just sort of became out of out of you know with a bit of a push right right like every once in a while you got to steer the boat but the waves the wind and the waves are are, are what's or what you're on right when you're at sea when you're sailing right in that analogy sense so so I think I think that's a really interesting that's a really interesting thing considering that in the history of music there are there are certain things that go on where people are um, they're not steering every once in a while what they're doing is they is their they they do that thing where they go after a certain objective or 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 there's no steering at all and they're just letting everything come and happen. Yeah. And we were somewhere in the middle, and that's what I think. That's what the, the beauty of it was, because that's that's what I got out of out of it, even just as a plain old participant, even though I was up to here with involvement otherwise. Um, but that's what it was, right? You know, when you come from a rock and roll or a pop music background or something like that, and you do, and you know, and even if you like weird stuff, when you actually do the weird stuff, that's the difference. <laughs> And yeah. I think that's what the difference is with or was with Ear of the Rat. And that's why it, that's why it, 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 I mean, I don't know what kind of effect we ever had. I don't know how influential we ever were or, you know, to, to other people in, in our own little scene in St. Catharines. But if we were, then, or just by virtue of the fact that we actually got away with it to, to, to do that every Friday yeah. night. And up to the point of broadcasting, and up to the point of so much archival, and up to the point of trying to play a music festival. I think that the, that's the main, the main, the main goal. That's 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 the that's the uh, that that's the main fulfillment for me. Yeah. That 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 I was that I was happy to be a part of. Like like something I kind of the analogy I make to it is that it it kind of it's like um, TV Ontario's night moves where they would like have like, you know, FM would come in, like <laughs> take over, take over the airwaves for like a couple of hours back in the seventies in the middle of the night yeah. on a Saturday night. And I, I consider, you know, what we were doing is almost, a, <laughs> you know, um, I, 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 yeah. I, I, like, I mean, I think that I, I have to talk to Jacob about this, but I, I wonder if the, you know, you know, it's kind of an on the nose homage to it. In that we were just, you know, okay, yeah, let's. Uh, well, let's see um, what this well, does. The one, well, the one. Listen, there was. Well, there, there was. There was something that John Jacob John uh, brought to my attention one time during the earlier period of *You're the Rat*, 
um, where where he where he he's a fan of, of obviously he's a fan of stuff too, and um, I'm a huge fan of the New York scene. Yep. And he 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 uh, laid on me this this little two things. He laid on me a documentary about this thing that these art people used to do in New York called the TV Party. And then okay. we actually watched the documentary itself about about that scene. And that was the New York late 70s, early 80s scene with like Basquiat and Glenn O'Brien and and uh, Vincent Gallo and Jim Jarmusch and uh, John Lurie and all these other people from that particular thing. Yep. And yep. Uh, and then they used to do this thing where they they they, they took over. Uh, what is it? A uh, what, what do they call that? Uh, public broadcasting. Yeah, uh, community access television. Cable exactly. Television. They yeah. had a, they had a community like access, our access like, television. Like McLean Hunter. Um, well, Kajiko now here or whatever. Well, yeah, Rogers, they basic, yeah. yeah, they basically had a. They were on a, a cable access channel, a public cable access channel in New York City, and right. they and they were on at like you know, 12 or to three in the morning, like for a whole, like three hours. Mm -hmm. And it was called Glenn O'Brien's, or it was called TV party. And then, and then years later, the documentary came out about it called Glenn O'Brien's TV party. And that's sort of similar. And again, to something that we were doing, right. There was, you know, cause there was a precedent in history there too. Yeah. That sort of collective, they sort of like, you know, kind of collectivist sort of art group, music group renegade sort of outsider thinking right <clears throat> you know just about controlling the means and controlling the the way to disseminate our information into the world that way right so so i think that was interesting because that, because that was something that clicked when when john and i were hanging out back then and we watched that documentary right. uh, about about tv party in the new york you know, new wave slash art nouveau scene mingling with each other and then hanging out on TV. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like that sort of thing. That's what we did, I think. With, in the, yeah, in the I think to an extent. With, yeah, with the Space Basement series, for sure. Well, I mean, with the live, with the live. Yeah, with taking, the, the video the, Taking stuff. it to that step further where we would be jamming and then we'd actually like broadcast it live. We'd invite people. Well, you can watch us play if you want. Right. It's, you know, like a gig. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we had like five, five to 20 people. <laughs> it max. Yeah, max. The minimum. It's, it's, it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. But <laughs> in the middle. Um, but, but I think that's what's an important thing to bring up, too, um, mm -hmm. is, is just the idea that, uh, multi, again, multimedia plays a big role in, in that, you know, again, you can just create your own means and, and and ends to those means and create a discipline in that way too. In a right. Means, I guess. Yeah. So I think that was a, that was a key thing at the moment. That was a really interesting thing because to see that like other people who they were, you know, they, you know, they had bands on and they didn't really have like a jam on or anything, anything like that. Right. But they, but they controlled the media. They controlled, you know, their, they had a control of the media that, right. was, that was able to supply their, to their, um, to just be able to express themselves, you know, in their right. own, in their own very acute, idiosyncratic way, and that is. But really without cool. a filter, without like, without the filter of. Well, you know, well, yeah, and and or whatever. Well, and it was the kind of show where they'd have you'd see all the underground, you know, B-list, C-list people, but then, but then, you know, they'd have like Iggy or Bowie on, as well. You know, just hanging out, and they, you know, they do interviews with artists, and they, you know. You know, and that's and and aside from like maybe having like a variety show, thank goodness we didn't do that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it would have ended up being more Ed Green, I think. <laughs> or yeah, yeah, maybe Ed Sullivan meets Ed Green. Uh, yep. Uh, over a sandwich. And Tom Green. Color. Tom Green, not Ed Green. Tom Green. Tom Green. Tom Ed Green. Green. Tom Green. All Ed O'Brien plays guitar. Said Glenn yeah. O'Brien. Now, just don't bring the Smothers Brothers into this. <laughs> but, but, um, but no. But short of short of going that far, we we stuck to a certain format and we we used that media, and then we were perpetuating that that kind of brand or that kind of idea, 
of, of you're the rat. And and then again, it's about the it's about the main gist of the idea, and it hits at the gut level, or or it hits at a very uh, spiritual level, the level of yeah. people. And I think again, that's what we had, you know, that's what we were in control of. That's what we were doing, facilitating, big time. And I think that that's really cool because that's the it's a similar energy to to what I've gotten out of um, seeing bands kind of go in that direction live even though they only do so rarely right kind of thing just that moment it's a momentary thing it's it's i think it's similar to like film in a, in a way where where you're where in film you're trying to capture like a certain feeling encapsulated within a moment in time right within a context or in a narrative and we did that musically and I think, and I, and, and, and again, that's, and we were able to do that because of the, the, what we were doing and the way that we did it. And, and, and again, being able to document it all. Right. And that's the powerful, that's the big thing. So. Yeah. Like what, what, what I find very fulfilling about it is the fact that, you know, we've got, it's still there. Like it's, it's online, you know, um, you can find it. Uh, well now and now it's established and, <laughs> yes. and and i think and i think so i think the project is is either um kind of like it's at a certain plateau mm -hmm. you know and um i mean because i haven't been involved in it obviously in quite some time right. at, at, at any particular level even as a guitarist so so i that, that's where i'm that's where i see it today that's how i see it today from where i'm sitting you know is that it's now it is this sort of it's still going and it's not necessarily like established or anything but it certainly has its own um life right its own existence its own you know momentum that could only be stopped by a virus <laughs> yeah as, as it happens yes as it happens <laughs> yes so i think i think that that's good that's a good show that's a good job well time to all right that's done <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I, you know, thank you very See much ya. for doing this. Yeah. Um, I do appreciate it. <laughs> Mic drop. Anyway, yeah. That's it. Get out of my house. This interview is over. <laughs> well, thanks very much for doing this, Jeff. I really do appreciate it. No, uh, I appreciate it too because because again, it's it's um, if we can call all of this information together. Yep. you know, and, and focus it through a certain way of, of letting it represent itself, I suppose. Yeah, well, I like I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I think this is going to be the first of basically an EOTR pro, uh, themed podcast and, you know, uh, I'll throw it on archive. We'll do that. Um, yeah. Maybe put, think, maybe put the video good. onto YouTube. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah I, that, would, that's kind of my intent. To, it would be, it would be neat to officially to get it down it would be a neat officially you know yeah i mean for the two or three in. people that listen to this they'll uh you know, they'll be like oh okay that's what that was about <laughs> well i mean the, 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 well the thing is is that it, it's it's weird because um i have to i almost have to say that there's a there's a there's, I, you know location comes into it yeah you know, because imagine if we had been doing that sort of thing. Like, imagine if the the setting, you know, was different. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, if we with had been doing this things, in the with all the same going on, all the same things you know, going on, and if, imagine if it was in Hamilton or in yeah. Buffalo or in Toronto. Yep. Or knows? in the valley in Los, you know, outside of Los Angeles. I mean, but you know that well, happened, right? I mean, yeah. Mind you, that that's been done, right? That's that's the whole. Well, I guess it's yeah. I guess it's been done. for sure. It's been done, but but um, I still believe in that sort of philosophy that that even if a tree falls in the forest, it still fell, even if there's nobody yep. there to see it. Yeah. So um, so I think so I think that. Well, it doesn't matter if we have fans or not. I mean, I know we had at least. I don't think that people. was even the point. I mean, that's the beauty of it, right? It really well, was just documentation. 
Well, yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think you're right. I think it was just primarily documentation, and 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 that was, and there was a subsequence as as a result, yeah. for sure. Um, and again, there was that in 2008. There was that one a uh, few months into that year. There was that one. Uh, I had a MySpace contact on my MySpace account, personal mm -hmm. MySpace account. It was connected to the Ear of the Rat MySpace account. When I when I founded the concept and, and made that and initially formatively put up the, the web representation yep. and managed it there and um and this person she was a music blogger and she blogged about us and mentioned us uh, I mentioned Ariel Pink that guy that artist and also mentioned Pink Floyd and John Cage and the Velvet Underground and um. Her name was Clarissa, something, and I know it's up there on the web somewhere where I've posted it or or whatever. But there there is an interesting article that she that she did, that she wrote, not necessarily boosting us and saying these guys are interesting and look how like. But she was. But the, the point is, is that we made her think right. somehow or re or rethink. As a listener, as a fan, and not even necessarily as an artist, and I think that is an important factor too. Right. That that, that sort of subsequent or inadvertent uh, effect that comes off of the sort of the stuff that we did that we did so humbly and so modestly can kind of can kind of can kind of from a from minor even in a minor way be a mini phenomenon in a way a revelation for people. Right. In that way, because I think you know, it inspired her to 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 contemplate the difference, I suppose, in terms of the title of the piece that she wrote between listening to the music and and uh, hearing what's there versus doing that and believing in significantly what's going on, right? Beyond just the passive listening. She did an interesting article about that, so feel feel free to look it up, or I'll try to supply that to you. Um, yeah, I, as fodder, you know what I mean, for any sort of yep. you know documentation about about what we're talking about, about any further efforts. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you, you know, can email me along any, uh, you know, any I can. I'll dig for it. I'll try to dig for it. I think I even anything that you find you know would be interesting to to kind of link with this. I think that would be cool. Yeah, yeah, and and that's the thing is that and and that's the thing is that when she wrote that, the beautiful thing about that was that she acknowledged us as a, as a collective, as a yeah. group, as the broken social scene, the 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 more deeper underground, you know, away from being careerist musicians, sort of that sort of vibe, right? You know? And that was and so that was huge. So that to me. It, it doesn't matter if it's one or two or three people. It matters how they feel. Right. If they're if if it's that thing where we're where we're where we're finally going. Oh, look, there are people, and and you know because that's a thing that happens to bands. Right. Anyway, even if you do just have one fan, you yeah. know, like I've I've been the one fan myself, showing up at somebody's gig, being all like, and they're all like, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And and um so I think that that's the similar thing. I don't think I don't think it's it's necessarily it's it's neither here or there. I mean, you know. Yep. Unless it's in an industry context and then that's a different world altogether. Um theoretically, right? So uh so I think that that was really that was that was something really interesting. And then and then people being interested that, that somehow there was an attraction, there was a sort of an aura around the group, around right. the dynamic uh, of that of that band, like in, in atmosphere and environment, where where musicians were interested, you know. And I yeah. think you know, and it's not like we're making music for musicians specifically, but that's the, that's you see, and that's what it's all about. It's about the work, you know. It's about the art. It's about the creativity and all of the motivation and ingenuity and intuitiveness behind it. And I think that that's what, that's what the, that was our, our sweet spot. That was our little place. Yeah. And, and, and that's what, and that's where, you know, 
there is a success to be considered in terms of people liking it. And that's amazing. And that's, that's amazing. Like that's, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look that in there. I wouldn't look at it in any other way, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's something I find fascinating about where, you know, um, SB5 has continued and, and now Space Basement 2020, where it, it changed, it, the dynamic changed, the growth of it changed. Well, yeah, the and fans then, and the... And, and the music itself yeah. as a result changed. I mean, I think Space Basement 2020, what we're doing right now has got a much heavier vibe to it, but that's mainly because, you know, most of the guys that are coming to the new jam are, you know, heavier well, think, guitars, well, see, heavier my, people. My take, yeah, my take on this is that I think if that sort of thing becomes kind of a scene or kind of a miniature scene, then that's then that's then that's what this sort of thing probably is <clears throat> or does as a in terms of uh, how purposeful it is. Yeah, it attracts yeah. people that are interested in in stepping outside, and that's that's all kinds of different genres of people in terms of musical stylization. Yeah, and and and, and, and I think that that and 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 it's also um, the real the real heavy point too. <clears throat> excuse me, is the idea that, that um, again, it, it, it's not necessarily a thing to have fans or even groupies or anything like that involved, but it, it's for the people who are really actually authentically interested in terms of listenership or even participation. Yeah. And again, it's a very specific, it's a very unique thing. It's not like, um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a different, um, it's like going to like a specific tailor and having them say, make me this shirt and I want it to be like this, this, that, and this, and the other thing mm -hmm. rather than, Oh, I'm going to go here and get this shirt. I'm going to go here and get that shirt. You know, it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a different shirt. It's a really different, it's a really very specific thing. Right. So in terms of taste, in terms of preference, and in terms of well, that, and, and I think that that can be a good thing as well. I mean, the other aspect with the space basement. Well, no, what I'm saying is that going. that is that's the attraction. Is that yeah. that's what the good thing is? Is that's what yeah. the attraction is? So that's why it doesn't matter if these well, guys are playing metal or if they're heavier, if they're lighter, if they're well, poppy, if it's you know what I mean. It doesn't matter yeah. which way it, it's going. It's there, it's the concentration of that attitude of that they don't want to do the box. They don't want to. Yeah. And well, the, this they is what I'm getting at is th yeah. this is actually what I was just going to speak to is the fact that the other, the other, the band that splintered off of it, Dave Donnelly's project, Full Spectrum Alliance, which you know, I'm right. also part of. And we, we got some recognition at Niagara, Mut Niagara Music uh, Awards last year for uh, a release that, um, uh, uh, shout out to Stanton Warren, uh, a venture lift for producing it for us. But, um, you know, we, you know, there, there, there's been stuff that came out of it, and that, what, what's kind of happened is, the FSA has, has kind of diverged into more of the shoegazy direction, and space basements kind of moved off into a heavier direction, and I think that's great. I mean, that's that's something I've been kind of fostering, uh, mm -hmm. in and and not necessarily in genre, but in the fact that yeah. the vibe has, the vibe between the two projects. Um, has has diverged and and I I think it's been fantastic uh, um, as a member of both projects um, just kind of you know each are moving into their own direction and and it's creating and it's growing and and it's doing what it is but that's all I was kind of getting at is and and I'm I'm really looking forward to like actually with the full spectrum alliance for for what it's worth uh, just a shout out to that um, uh, Dave was able to come down and we spent two days recording the weekend of March, the weekend of, you know, Friday, March 13th and 14th, I think it was. And it was just as the lockdown was happening. And we basically got what I actually wasn't able to go to the second recording, but we, the 13th and the 14th, Friday and Saturday of March there, 13th and 14th, and we did manage to get uh, a number of really good recordings together in a, but that project has changed. That project was more of a, we sit down, uh, you know, uh, Dave takes over, uh, Dave takes over a large, um, a large space within, uh, it's essentially the library of an old school. Uh, and we, um, 
uh, we have a, a two days of, of of recording with more of a Tom Waits vibe where Dave has a musical idea and says, I, I wanted to do this. And then we just do it, you know, um, and okay. that, so that, that has become a band and I'm actually really looking yeah. forward to what comes out of that, uh, out of those sessions, uh, back in March. But then meanwhile, space basement is continuing on with the spirit of the SB projects, uh, SB, you know, three, four, five, and, um, and you're the rat before that, right? Right. Well, there's overlap, that's, obviously, no, and because that, and that's, you're and the that's rat was cause, SB. Yeah. Go well, ahead. no, because I and I'm glad the music's still at least like for what it's safe for what it is is yeah. different yeah. in that way, and it didn't give in like you know to in any one particular one person's or whatever vibe with that. Right. Um, um because i'll be honest i think i think the radio shout outs that john did were great and everything but i think it took away from the unanimous collectivism of it in a lot of ways it, I, that's just my take on it but then but then that was the weird thing in terms of in terms of like the work the work the labor division <laughs> yeah in terms of creativity in the group it wasn't it wasn't so it wasn't like the cure or manic street preachers or anything weird like that it was it was really like it was really like if somebody had something they 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 went forward with it right whether it right. was me or john or chandra in terms of say like a vocalization to add to music or lyrics or, or call right. it or whatever and and they and it you know but yeah. and I, or and donley was, later on or dave later on or example. dave or yeah. you know or wade or whatever so there was a lot of ambitious different flavors different modes of ambition taking place and and point in, right. in time um that way um but i even yeah, or even gen for I that was, matter actually there's so many people or, that or gen, well, yeah vocals, there's so yeah. many there's so many featured quote unquote you could say arguably so sorry if i'm, I'm like i want to i'm fantasizing about a haircut right now <laughs> aren't we all <laughs> well <laughs> it's a mess it's look at this and like well i like it but it, but it's like it's i gotta need a, i need a haircut i really do <laughs> um yeah all good it's just whatever but but it's uh but there was a lot of different things going on where where i would come up with i mean it's all in the history the point is is that if you really really want to know you got it as a fan as a listener being you or anybody else you you, you go through it you got to go you through go the tapes through because because john is on so many different like so much of it like okay um like there's so much of the the bulk of what we did on archive.org as ear the rat or space right. based on your sp5 or whatever right right we're talking big picture stuff and and um but there's so much of it primarily predominantly that's just you know no vocal instrumental right and then there's some stuff where john does a lot of calling out EOTR one or whatever space basement or SP five and and and, yeah. and and then and then he's got his tracks or not his tracks but he's got moments where he's a featured person in terms right. of a vocal or or a you know not necessarily the idea of the song because the no. song was everybody right right was was uh, you know uh, but he would do the stream of consciousness kind of not not really not uh kind of spoken word um kind of stuff it's like this as well. it's like this it's like this thing the way that it's like this thing the way that's like some pack animals do <laughs> you know where you've got a herd of people and then one and eventually you know you know you'll have a you have a leader of the herd and then the, but then the leader comes back and it's still a herd and it's moving along you know that's what we were like. That's what we were like, pri like prior to before you got there. Yeah. Between 2005, especially around 2008 to down to 2012, in those years, right? In those four years before you sort of really showed up on a regular basis. Yep. That's what was going on. We, you know, and it's and it's right there, and the proofs in the pudding, and in, in everything that John's got documented, and everything I've got documented in archive.org. It's all there. It's all yep. right there. So there, you know, so there's the moments that I step forward and, and take the jam into a direction by providing a, low, a vocal or a lyric. Chandra did the same thing. John did the same thing. We pass that head around 
right. then there was and then most of the time there was nobody singing and then and then you know and, and that even goes with the same with um with dave's involvement or even jen's or even or even yours yeah or, or tom for that matter i mean or tom I, yeah well tom never Tom's really bass, got up and did, did but up, but, you know. but i'm but his bass and then later on his synth work has been everywhere um, well he's he's, he's, he's always just to, he's the tape guy he is the ta he's the guy yeah. who really brought that in to the situation i mean i love tom borden because because not just because he's one of my greatest friends you know but also because of the way he's so like he um you know it's really funny i don't know you don't know this but i brought him in first before i even called the dmt people and then yeah, actually i did know that he was there right from the beginning i actually well, did you know were there that. you were there in the odd time it, yeah but i was semi-regular it was kind of an on occasion thing i'd show up here and there for a few weeks i remember in 2005 you were with it and then not until like 2012 right pretty much pretty much yeah that's pretty, pretty much, much right. for, to be fair if we're documenting things to be objective yep. here um so and then he tommy got into a bit of a, a spat because of well look at tom look at jared right and the musical whatever um but then later on, when I brought Tom back in, <laughs> and then the BMT people showed up, and then Tom, you know, he's he's like a wizard, kind of. Mm -hmm. Out of the robe comes something, and people are like, oh, what the fuck is that? Is that fire? Is that electricity? <laughs> is that yeah. magic? Is that science? Yes, it is. That's yeah. art. And, and, um, and so basically, so he took, he, you know, even with the BMT people involved and were here the rat. Well, I, I always thought he brought a little Frank Zappa to it all, you know, just. Well, and then not some. necessarily and from a, the, not, not Frank from Zappa's just scratching the surface. Right. Really. Right. Yeah. Because he's, because he really, he really, um, I really learned a lot about a lot of crazy ass outside of culture for him. Yeah. That I'm a fan of today and have yeah. been for like a really long time. So he brought that into it. And again, it's that, that sort of element too. I mean, right. I mean, there's, I mean, it's a generational thing too. And then that's another thing that there's just such a multitude of, of influence and energy going on because there's a multitude of, of influences and a generational thing. Cause in Tom's generation, he remembers growing up with like Lydia lunch and right. swans and the New York new wave and, 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 you know, yeah. And then, and then there's people that are younger than him you know, that are like Chandra and you and Breezewick. And then there's people that are younger than you guys that are like me. Uh, and then people younger than me, like, you know, like Johnny Earhart and like Mike May, right? right. And things like that, right? So there, so that's another consideration into how interesting and intrinsically unique this is as well. Because it's a really mixed bag of, of, right. of in terms of generation. As much as it is any any other consideration, as far as musical influence or what have you, right? You know, and that and because you don't get that with broken social team, right? One of them isn't fifty five and the other one isn't twenty two. They're all like <laughs> third. They're all you know hipster whatever. <laughs> they're yeah. all like thirty two to like four forty seven. That's it. Right. Right. Yep. You know. <laughs> And, and there isn't like one person in the group who's like he's the weird guy but we like him you know, like, like there, there isn't no they really like if you think about it that they don't have that right you know sort of thing it's a different it's a different world right you know, that we have you could say compared to theirs in realistic terms for, and i for think sure. we used and i think we really utilize that because because the night that tom brought over his video own videos he shocked the shit out of Chandra and John. <laughs> well, I just sat there and I was like, yep. <laughs> you know? And at first, even for those people being as different as they were in the type of, of attitude with music that they play individually, let alone contributing that to the group, even they were taken back by, by some of that. But that was the edge. You see, that's the thing. Right. It, that's what made the Velvet Underground, for example, that's what made the Velvet Underground so really cool. They had an edge. Right. And there's nothing wrong with, like, whether you're, um, I think it's good to have an edge. I think it's good yeah, to I have agree. that sort of, and that's the edge. Tom brought some of that edge. Just like how I thought, well, we needed the edge of 
of having people like the BMT people and you and whoever else show up. Right. Just to make it different than the same old stuff. The same old the same old AM FM radio rock right. jam, blues, jazz, conventional sort of sort of thing. You know? And I think that's what I think and I think that's what I would like to see personally happen if there is a serious documentary made that it's, it's talking about that. It's talking about, you know, <clears throat> it's it just like the, I don't know how wonderful that was. Mm -hmm. It was you a know? great moment for sure. And it still is because it still happens Yep. in that way. And I, and, and at least that's the, the, the thing that I can rely on in terms of dependability, I suppose, is, is to know that things will always organically happen. They'll always come up from from how interested people are in what they do with another artist's work, right? More more than any other sort of ambition or agenda to do with that, you know. And because because that was the thing that I mean, um, I, I, to be honest, I think I had been asked by people, you know, like what's that all about? What's that ear of the rat thing all about? <laughs> right what like what that? are you actually trying to do like where are like what's this thing supposed to be and that's right. the weirdness right there was a weirdness with that just like with unusual species where it was like well we just do things our own way and 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 we're not particularly obligated to anything other than the idea right. or the ideas and that's and i think that's something that that comes into play here i think that's the thing that really strengthens it you know yeah. <clears throat> well, I, well, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, well, thank before. you, thank you um, for yeah. I appreciate it. I've got, I get family who've come home, uh, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, okay. Right on. Yeah. So I, I like I said, I really appreciate you doing this, and uh, definitely yeah. after the after this um, after you know things loosen up a little bit and stuff, uh, maybe the next time you're you're down at St. Catherine's. And the stars align. Uh, we can um, have you uh, have you come as a featured artist <laughs> for Space no. Basement 2020. No, no, I don't. I don't have to be featured. I just have to be there. <laughs> Show up with that beautiful jag of yours, and we'll uh, make some tunes. Well, I, I'm planning on. Well, this is the thing. I'm talk. I talked to Greg yesterday. Yeah. After I talked to you. Okay. And I and I started some chatting with him about actually getting some people together. Not Ear of the Rat reunion or not whatever you guys are doing now, but just a, a couple of people at his place. Right, right. <clears throat> and um, just for the fun, because we did that a couple, we did that like last year, right, with the Alien Cop Jam. Yeah, thing. yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I noticed that you and Greg are kind of, it seems like a semi-annual or annual kind of thing that you guys are doing. Um, well, I think well, it's no, great, no. actually. Um, well, it's not even, it's not even, it's not even set like that. It just happened. It's just happening, yeah. Like we just happened to do it because we well because the thing that is annually happening that has been for like a while the last eight years has been the Gord High Memorial Jams. Of course, yep. Here in Toronto, that Greg, both Greg and I are part of, and then right in the uh, in in the summertime, I've said to them, to those guys there, do you want to get together at Greg's? Right. For the hell of it, right? And just do whatever we do at the warehouse, you know, re rehearsal factory place. Right on Geary Ave, you know, there in St. Catharines and, and you know, the Alien Cop Jam was as, as successful as as far as attendance was concerned. Yeah. Regarding well that. I think the tapes are great. Uh I, I've I've watched your YouTube uh, of it and Thanks. and I encourage you to continue doing that. I mean bring that camera and and keep keep doing that. Sure. You know Yeah, for sure. Uh, cool. be, because I think it's important as well. I mean like this is the other thing, right? I mean I, I, I you know, as a videographer, you know, I, I think that's important um, for us to continue documenting these things in the way that I'm, you know, recording the Space Basement Jams now, uh, taking over from Merv, and uh, and uh, the way that you've been recording, uh, you know, whenever the the goal, I know the annual Gord High Memorial and uh, Jam, uh, which is, yeah, I'm so glad that's still going on. I'm. I, I, as you know, I've never met him or his wife, but uh, I, yeah. I didn't meet him. I haven't met his wife, but I, I know that I know that he is um, 
a, a keystone in the improvisational and uh, improvisational world of Ontario as well, and was definitely a, one of the early boosters of home rock. Um, uh, yeah, to Gord well. High's credit, I do believe that he was because he's in that generation of people like yourself and Greg Gunn and John Griswick um, and, and that particular set of people at a certain time in their lives were busy in Guelph. Uh, not yeah. John, but, but definitely No, and that, that actually goes, touches on what I was talking about as well. I mean, yeah. there's a legacy there. Um, you know, there's, well, this an sort of, entire, there's an entire school yeah. in the University of Guelph that focuses on improvisation, not just Here. improvisational music, but also push improv pause, comedy. And need, and, yeah. Push pause and I need to go to the bathroom. We'll be right back. Okay. 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 So we are talking about how I improvisation in Guelph is, is, you know, there's a school of it and everything at U of, at U of G. Well, separate from that, I think outside of that, there was, there, you know, Greg Gunn on his own accord and his own merit and, and Gord High definitely and some of their mutual friends were doing, you know, kind of uh, home recordings or experimental home recordings or performance or, or you know, playing parties or whatever, that kind of sort of thing. Um, and my discovery of that personally leads me to believe that, that it's, 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 it's like with anything, like any basement band, the potential for that sort of, I mean, we really hit it big in a, you know, accidentally, unwittingly, with, with mm -hmm. something like Ear of the Rat and it being a conceptualized jam rock and, and all that thing. Um, but the potential of that always starts when it comes to home rock. You know, the potential of that springs out of ex home recording, experimental recordings, experimental performances. Yep. improvisational types of composition or incidental music. Right. So I think that's the connection there is that the wonderful thing about, you know, the Guelph scene um, and even to the point where they acknowledge that scene, you could say if it is in fact a scene with, with an academic nod in that of offering a course to the public, that that's a, that's a, that's, that's a really cool, interesting thing. Um, but again, I think the energy of like what we've done with Year of the Rat or what happened with those jams right. evolving into that, it's the potential of, of what can blow up to be that big or that involved in the thing always starts with the, the little, the little projects at home. It always starts with, again, the home record, the little, you know, private home recordings or individual <clears throat> musical or sonic experiments and, mm -hmm. and curiosities and interests into, you know, into that, into that sort of way of doing things. Yeah. Yeah. I guess awesome. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, I guess I'll leave it with that because I think that's where the whole, that's what this whole history speaks of. Right. Like all of this linear stuff that I talked about today. And as far as what I was doing, but also I guess what other people were doing too and how we all or brought it all together coalesced in into this past. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's, and that's what, um, that's, that's what it is. Seniors, you know, that's totally yep. what it is. Well, you know, Brian, Eno, he had, he had this concept of what it is to have a, a like a, like a, like an energy coming from a, a community. That's right. what it, that's what, that's what a scene is. Isn't any, isn't it really? Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, it's, exactly. It's a, it's a, it's sort of a, it's a microculture, a subculture that, that in and of itself constitutes a community of, of like-minded, generally speaking, like-minded points of view. Right. And I think that, that, and I think that's what we have. You're the rat is essentially for, um, you know, I think that's what I did. I, I discovered the community that we had made and I pushed it further you know, to a certain degree, and then it's gone on its own momentum. And along the way, it's like the, it is like the note, you know, being passed from person to person or the torch, right? you know, and it, and it just keeps going like that. And I think that that's, that's the legacy. The important thing is that there is a legacy involved. Yeah, and exactly. That, and that the legacy is just its continued um, presence. Um, Maybe even well, yeah. Maybe even regardless, regardless of you know 
certain personalities because because you know the formative things are are, are definitely important but but there's always time passing right so right here's to time passing yep <laughs> Cheers. Okay, right so I'm letting you go for real. <laughs> Thanks so much for doing this. All right, thank um, you very much, Matt. Our, our next episode is going to have uh, Jacob John Vrieswick, uh, another co-founder, um, along with uh, Jeff, of uh, certainly the second phase of You're the Rat. And um, thanks. It's, it's great. Thanks so much for doing this. Well, he can, he can well, I, I, I'd egg you on to interview him about what he was up to and his perspective prior to his involvement. Yeah, absolutely. Cause you did talk there, about there's a, there's there's a story a there. parallel stream of, uh, of improv jams that were happening as well. Like you mentioned yeah, earlier in our call. There's a, there, yeah. There's a parallel worth exploring. So good on, good on you. And thank you. All right. Thanks again, Jeff.